Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all-amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1143, with a release and air date of Saturday, January 23rd, 2021. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1143 of This Week in Amateur Radio. President Biden taps Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel as acting FCC chair. The FCC issues an unprecedented enforcement advisory informing radio users that you cannot use radios in the process of committing a crime. In response to the FCC enforcement advisory, the ARRL reminds everyone on the purpose of amateur radio. The Orlando Hamcation QSO party and virtual Hamcation is all set to happen and we will have the details for you. Over the horizon radars and other shortwave activity continue to clutter the 40 and 20 meter bands. Researchers in the United States envision a new replacement for the Arecibo telescope. A city of Chicago antenna regulation is upturned by a recent FCC ruling. ICOM is releasing firmware updates for several of its radios. We will tell you which ones. And for a hunting decoy manufacturer, the cost of radio frequency interference is dear. We will tell you all about this and a lot of other stories are coming your way with this week's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will break down the mystery surrounding the bands used by 5G, and we'll also talk about a lot of bytes. Australia's own Anil Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be here to comment on the APRS of it all. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill continues his coverage of the 1945 frequency allocation battles. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will present part three of writing a successful public service announcement for air on broadcast radio to promote your next club event. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our UV-lit, disinfected, and HEPA-filtered headquarters studio in cold and gray, overcast. Is the sun still out there? I know the propagation forecast says it is, but we haven't seen the sun here in the Northeast for weeks. Someone send me a picture of it. And maybe some vitamin D, too. <laughs> I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the snowy southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau in historic Armory Square from downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, waiting for that lake effect snow machine to crank up. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it's snowing fit to beat the band and even the ducks are walking, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. Reporting from a seasonally mild news bureau in Troy, New York, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And back in studio, one of our Central Florida news bureau, where the weather is getting warmer, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it might snow, or it might not. Oh, wait a minute, look, it's snowing outside. Crazy weather we have. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. This is W2XBS with some late breaking news as we come to air this week. President Joseph Biden this week designated FCC Commissioner Jessica Wozenworcel as acting chair of the FCC. 
She succeeds, at least temporarily, former FCC Chair Ajit Pai, who resigned effective on January 20th. I am honored to be designated as the acting chairwoman of the Federal Communications Commission by President Biden, Wilson Wurzel said in a statement. I thank the president for the opportunity to lead an agency with such a vital mission and talented staff. It is a privilege to serve the American people and work on their behalf to expand the reach of communications opportunity in the digital age. Prior to joining the FCC, she served as Senior Communications Counsel for the United States Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Before entering public service, she practiced communications law in Washington, D.C. The newest FCC commissioner, Nathan Symington, a Republican appointee, said Worsen Worsel brings deep knowledge and experience and highly informed judgment to her new position and he expressed appreciation that the Biden administration acted promptly to establish FCC leadership by selecting such a distinguished public servant for this vital role. Fellow Democrat Jeffrey Starks said Wozenworcel has been a passionate advocate for bringing the benefits of broadband to all Americans, particularly our children. He said her designation as acting chair comes at a critical juncture for the commission as the pandemic has made bold action to end inequality more vital than ever. The commission's other Democrat appointee, Brendan Carr, called Wilson Wurzel a talented and dedicated public servant, as evidenced by her eight years of distinguished service on the FCC. On Twitter, Wilson Wurzel said, the future belongs to the connected, and she described herself as an impatient optimist, a mom, a wife, and an inveterate coffee drinker. And now with this week's lead story, we go to Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Dave? Leading off our news this week, the FCC Chief of the Enforcement Bureau has released an enforcement advisory for licensees and operators across all radio services. Warning! Amateur and personal radio service licensees and operators may not use radio equipment to commit or facilitate criminal acts. The Enforcement Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission issues this enforcement advisory to remind licensees in the amateur radio service, as well as licensees and operators in the personal radio services, that the Commission prohibits the use of radios in those services to commit or facilitate criminal acts. The Bureau has become aware of discussions on social media platforms suggesting that certain radio services regulated by the Commission may be an alternative to social media platforms for groups to communicate and coordinate future activities. The Bureau recognizes that these services can be used for a wide range of permitted purposes, including speech that is protected under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Amateur and personal radio services, however, may not be used to commit or facilitate crimes. Specifically, the Bureau reminds amateur licensees that they are prohibited from transmitting communications intended to facilitate a criminal act or messages encoded for the purpose of obscuring their meaning, as stated in Part 97.113, Subpart A, Paragraph 4. Likewise, individuals operating radios in the personal radio services, a category that includes citizens' band radios, family radio service walkie-talkies, and general mobile radio service, are prohibited from using those radios in connection with any activity which is against federal, state, or local law, as stated in Part 95.333, Subpart A of the Rules. Individuals using radios in the amateur or personal radio services in this manner may be subject to severe penalties, including significant fines, seizure of the offending equipment, and, in some cases, criminal prosecution. To file a complaint with the FCC, visit https colon slash slash consumercomplaints.fcc.gov or call 1-888-CALL-FCC. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia.
On the heels of the FCC Enforcement Advisory, the ARRL has issued the following. For over 100 years, Amateur Radio and the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, have stood for the development of the science and art of communications, public service, and the enhancement of international goodwill. Amateur Radio's long history and service to the public has solidified the well-earned reputation that Amateur Radio saves lives. Amateur radio operators, due to their history of public service, their training, and the requirement that they be licensed by the FCC, have earned their status as a component of critical communications infrastructure and as a reliable resource when all else fails. Amateur radio is about development of communications and responsible public service. Its misuse is inconsistent with its history of service and its statutory charter. The ARRL does not support its misuse for purposes inconsistent with these values and purposes. Orlando Hamcation has announced it will sponsor the Hamcation CUSO party over the February 13th and 14th weekend UTC to create a fun way for amateurs to celebrate the Orlando Hamcation experience over the air. With more details on this special event, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from ARRL headquarters in Newington. The Hamcation QSO party will be a 12-hour event on Hamcation weekend. Hamcation 2021 was to host the ARRL National Convention, which now will take place in 2022. The Orlando Hamcation Special Edition online event over the February 13th, 14th weekend will take the place of what would have been Hamcation 2021 in person. The Hamcation QSO party will run from 1500 UTC on February 13th until 0300 UTC on February 14th. It'll be a CW and SSB operating event on 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. Everybody works everybody. Categories will be high power, low power, and QRP. All participants will be single operators. The exchange is name, state, province, country, and outside temperature at your location. Nine Hamcation special event stations with one-by-one -one call signs will be on the air with combined suffixes spelling out Hamcation. Report scores on www.3830scores.com. No logs required. Final results will be based on the information submitted to 3830. The QSO party will replicate the camaraderie and social experience of attending Hamcation and provide a way to have fun on the radio since Hamcation 2021 will not be held due to the ongoing pandemic. Station guest operators must use their own call signs and submit their scores individually. Plaques and certificates will be awarded. Meanwhile, the Orlando Hamcation Special Edition online event over the February 13th and 14th weekend will take place on what would have been Hamcation 2021's in-person show. The online event will include youth, technology, contesting, and vendor webinar tracks. ARRL will also present two webinars on Saturday, February 13th. They are the member 1 p.m. East ST moderated by ARRL Southeast Division Director Mickey Baker, M4MB, and the Amateur Radio Service Presentation at 3 p.m. EST moderated by ARRL Director of Emergency Management Paul Gilbert, KE5ZW. The ARIES presentation will include panelists from ARRL Section Emergency Coordinator in Florida. Nine Hamcation Special Event Stations with one-by-one -one call signs will be on the air with combined suffixes spelling out Hamcation. Each contact will count as one point and stations may be worked once on each band and mode. Entrants will report their scores on www.3830scores.com. No logs are required. Final results will be based on the information submitted to that website. Live online prize drawings are also scheduled during the Hamcation Special Edition online event. The Over the Horizon Radars reports that Over the Horizon Radars have increasingly been finding spectrum on 17 and 15 meters. Above all, the Russian Over the Horizon Radar, known as Container, as well as Over the Horizon Radars from China, continue to affect amateur radio more and more, sometimes quite massively, said Over the Horizon Radars newsletter editor Peter Jost. HB9 CET in the December edition with three or four such signals showing in the same band. Significantly fewer FSK transmissions as well as the characteristic 
CIS-12 signals from the Commonwealth of Independent States were to be found. For some time now, a broadcast station is active every day at 1100 to 1258 UTC at 7200 kHz, Jost said, adding that the signal appears to be coming from Taiwan. The broadcast station, Voice of Broad Masses from Eritrea, can be heard daily on 7140 kHz and increasingly also on 7180 kHz, he added. Occasionally, better conditions during November 2020 revealed fishing boy signals and an Iranian over-the-horizon radar on 10 meters. The Chinese over-the-horizon radar, nicknamed Foghorn, was and is a daily troublemaker, Josh reported back in November. Nobody should be complacent about the access to the frequency spectrum enjoyed by radio enthusiasts. There's only one spectrum, but a huge number of organizations, commercial, military and amateur, who use it. The interests of amateur radio are represented by the International Amateur Radio Union, with battles won and battles lost over access to the spectrum, mainly drummed out over the table at the World Radio Conference, which takes place every four years. As you will hear in this report, just holding on to what we've already got, let alone trying to win new access, is quite a challenge. Preparations continue at the International Amateur Radio Union, the IARU, to represent the interests of the amateur and amateur satellite services at the World Radio Communication Conference 2023, better known as WRC 23. The location of the 2023 conference has yet to be decided. The International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, sponsors WRCs, typically every four years, to consider revisions to the international radio regulations that define frequency allocations for various radio services. David Sumner, Kilo One Zulu Zulu, the IARU secretary, said that, as an incumbent radio service with allocations at intervals throughout the radio spectrum, the amateur service faces challenges at every WRC. David added that successfully defending amateurs' existing access to the spectrum is a significant accomplishment at any WRC, but sometimes it's possible to improve on existing allocations. For example, WRC 19 resulted in major improvements in 50 MHz allocations in Region 1, which covers Africa, Europe, the Middle East and Northern Asia. David said that, without any doubt, this could not have happened without the concerted efforts of dozens of IARU volunteers over the course of several years. You can read more on the ARRL website at www.arrl.org. Just head for the news section. A deer rotro with winds of 80 to 100 miles per hour struck eastern Iowa last August, disrupting power and telecommunications for some 400,000 residents. With more details on this unique story, we go to League Headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. As ARRL member and amateur radio emergency service volunteer Scott Haney, N0GUD, recently explained to The Gazette in Cedar Rapids, that's when amateur radio shines. Haney, the president of the Cedar Valley Amateur Radio Club, was the focus of the January 19th newspaper feature. Haney says, for some people, amateur radio is merely a hobby, but for a lot of us, it's much more than that. Ham radio operators are involved in emergency management, in large event management, in a large variety of things. A lot of times, people don't know we're there, he said. People don't realize, especially in weather events like hurricanes, that amateur radio is a huge part of getting people in and out of dangerous areas. We've been doing that for decades. As the article notes, the fact that Collins Aerospace, formerly Collins Radio and Rockwell Collins, calls Cedar Rapids home is believed to be the reason for the second highest population density of hams in the world in eastern Iowa. Haney retired in 2019 after 30 years with Rockwell Collins and Collins Aerospace. He's been licensed for more than 40 years. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net.
With the ruins of the historic Arecibo telescope still fresh in people's minds, there's already a movement to rebuild one that's bigger and better. Researchers in the United States are envisioning a new replacement for the historic telescope. Researchers have presented the National Science Foundation with a proposal for a $400 million replacement of the Arecibo telescope on the same site where its iconic predecessor suffered its fatal collapse late last year in Puerto Rico. Speaking in a January 14th post on the Science Magazine website, the scientists described what they said would be a system that would prove useful to astronomers as well as researchers who study the planets and the atmosphere. Anish Roshi, head of astrophysics at the observatory, outlined the scope of the proposed replacement, known as the Next Generation Arecibo Telescope. It was described as a flat, 300-meter-wide, rigid platform bridging the sinkhole and studded with more than 1,000 closely packed 9-meter dishes. Hydraulics would make the telescope's disk steerable, tilting it more than 45 degrees from the horizontal. Modern receivers would be built into each dish, covering a broader frequency range than that of the previous telescope. It would be designed to have almost twice the sensitivity of the original telescope and four times the radar power. The project would, of course, need funding from the United States Congress, and as the Science Magazine article points out, Puerto Rico's representative in Congress is a non-voting member. Nonetheless, engineer Ramon Lugo said, we have to be optimistic that we will make this happen. The Dayton Hamvention will not take place for the second year in a row. With distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine falling behind schedule in the U.S., organizers of Hamvention 2021 have called off the annual event for the second consecutive year. The executive committee posted the news on various social media outlets on Monday, January 11th, citing several setbacks related to the pandemic, with a vaccine delay named among them. Sponsored by the Dayton Amateur Radio Association, Hamvention was set to take place May 21st to the 23rd in Xenia, Ohio. Hundreds of volunteers have been working to do everything necessary to bring this Hamvention to the many amateur radio enthusiasts and vendors who support the Dayton Hamvention. However, vaccine distribution both in the United States and around the world is lagging behind what was planned. In addition, the emergence of a more communicable form of the virus increases the potential for further public health problems in the next few months. We make this difficult decision for the safety of our guests and vendors. Those who had their tickets deferred last year will be deferred again. The committee said the show would return in 2022 and hinted at a QSO party for Hamvention Weekend. In November, Hamvention had announced that the gathering would be the theme for the 2021 show. Hamvention is the largest annual amateur radio gathering in the United States and was host of the AWRL National Convention in 2019. Other canceled 2021 events include the Gwinnett Amateur Radio Society Tech Fest and AWRL Convention in Lawrenceville, Georgia, the DeSoto Amateur Radio Club DeSoto County Ham Fest in Arcadia, Florida, the St. Cloud Amateur Radio Club Cabin Fever Reliever in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The Inner City Amateur Radio Club Mansfield Midwinter Ham Fest in Mansfield, Ohio. The LaPorte County Amateur Radio Ham Fest in LaPorte, Indiana. The Brazos Valley Amateur Radio Club's Greater Houston Ham Fest in Rosenberg, Texas. The Mike and Key Amateur Radio Club Electronic Swap Meet in Puyallup, Washington. The Northern Ohio Amateur Radio Society Winter Ham Fest in Elira, Ohio. The Mecklenburg Amateur Radio Society's annual Charlotte Ham Fest in Concord, North Carolina. The Martin County Amateur Radio Association's 46th annual Martin County Ham Fest in Stewart, Florida. The Charlotte Ham Fest Committee AWRL West Virginia Section Convention and Charleston Area's Ham Fest in Charleston, West Virginia. And finally, the Oregon to Lallatin Valley ARC and the Clark County ARC CPAC AWRL Northwestern Division Convention in Seaside, Oregon. In a January 5th public notice, 
The FCC requested comments on whether the current 14 volunteer examiner coordinators are sufficient to facilitate the efforts of their accredited volunteer examiners in administering amateur radio examinations or whether up to five additional volunteer examiner coordinators should be authorized. The ARRL VEC is the largest of the 14 volunteer examiner coordinators in the U.S. Comments are due by February 5th and reply comments, which are comments filed on existing comments, are due by February 19th. After Congress authorized it to do so, the FCC adopted rules in 1983 to allow volunteers to prepare and administer amateur radio examinations, and it established the system of volunteer examiner coordinators and volunteer examiners. Volunteer examiner coordinators introduced consistency into the volunteer examiner program by centralizing accreditation of volunteer examiners, coordinating the dates and times for scheduling examinations, and managing the various administrative tasks arising from examinations, the FCC said. Authorized VECs may operate in any of the 13 VEC regions, but must service at least one region. The FCC pointed out that some volunteer examiner coordinators now offer remote examinations. The Commission has long maintained 14 volunteer examiner coordinators and now seeks to consider whether they continue to serve the evolving needs of the amateur community or whether there are unmet needs that warrant considering expanding the number of VECs. The FCC public notice provided questions for framing comments. Are the existing 14 volunteer examiner coordinators sufficient to coordinate the efforts of volunteer examiners in preparing and administering examinations for amateur radio operator licenses, or are additional VECs needed? What needs are currently being met, and which needs, if any, are not? If the FCC were to allow additional volunteer examiner coordinators, how many more would be needed to satisfy existing amateur radio service license examination needs? The FCC indicated that it will likely cap the number of additional VECs at five. Given that volunteer examiner coordinators use a collaborative process to create examination question pools and volunteer examination administration protocols, would additional VECs enhance or hinder this process? How would increasing the number of volunteer examiner coordinators address the unmet needs, if any, of the amateur radio community, and what obstacles or complications could result from increasing the number of VECs? Interested parties may file short comments on WT Docket number 21-2 via the FCC's Electronic Comment Filing Service Express. Visit the FCC's How to Comment on FCC Proceedings page for information on filing extended comments. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. Good article in Ars Technica breaking down 5G. And I thought this would be good to pass it along because you're already seeing ads from companies, won't name names, that 5G is already here in the NFL stadiums. 11 stadiums have 5G in one little corner over by the taco stand, that's it, uh, that some cities have 5G. Well, if it's AT&T, it's not really 5G. It's 5GE, which is really just LTE. So there's a lot of, you know, you don't have a 5G phone unless you're nuts. There are some 5G phones you can buy, not from Apple, but Samsung has one. OnePlus has one, but they're really expensive. 
And the worst part is when you buy the phone, you're required to sign up for non-existent 5G service at a much higher price. Oh, and your battery life's going to be terrible. So I'm not recommending 5G at this point. But this article and uh, is by Rob Pegoraro. And I thank you, Rob, for writing this because it's not long, but it kind of clarifies this whole confusing mess. He starts, the long-touted fifth generation, that's what 5G means, of wireless communications is not magic. <laughs> It'll be nice. But it it's really a, a, a basket of technologies, and that's part of the problem. It's 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 you may hear some wonderful things, but that is about a particular kind of 5G. It's he says the first thing to know about 5G, it's a family affair, sometimes a dysfunctional family affair, because there are three different wireless frequencies for 5G, and each of them works very differently. There's one, the one most people talk about, the one I usually talk about, millimeter wave 5G. It's at 24 gigahertz. Now your Wi-Fi is at 2.4 gigahertz, 24 gigahertz. That's why it's millimeter wave. It's micro wave. And you may know this. One of the reasons it's safe to use your microwave oven is because these very small uh, frequencies, like even 2.4 gigahertz, bounce off of things. A piece of paper, they will bounce off of. A leaf, they will bounce off of. So at 24 gigahertz, you have to be very close to the tower. The tower, they'll need four times the tower density for millimeter wave 5G. And line of sight, and it's not going to go through walls. It probably won't even you know go through your windows at your office. However, <laughs> it's fast. If you can get it, 1.2 gigabits, very low latency, 9, millis 9 to 12 milliseconds, very much like your landline internet if you had really good internet. That's line of sight, and it was 900 feet from the transmitter. <laughs> so you're, you're not, we're well, not, no one. Uh -uh. Maybe if you live in a very dense city and you happen to be close to the tower, maybe. And in fact, this will be used in areas like that for uh, home internet, I suspect. So that's that's one flavor. And probably not the one you and I are going to get. Then there's the one T-Mobile already just launched at 600 megahertz. Much, much longer frequencies. That travels great through walls and stuff. But it's not that much faster. Uh, Sprint, then there's this, that's low band. Then there's mid band, which Sprint's launched uh, at 2.5 gigahertz. That's the same as LTE. That's the same as close to Wi-Fi. So lower f speed, but it'll travel better. And you'll probably get 100 megabits, which is pretty good. I mean, you'd everybody would be happy with that. Although I have to point out, I, you know, on a good day with a good carrier and not too congested a cell site, I get 100 megabits on my on Verizon, AT&T, some of these others, on, on LTE. So this is the problem. It's so, you see, I already I'm confused. There's three bands, millimeter wave, medium wave, and low band, as they call it. AT&T is starting to launch the low band. <laughs> Oh, and another thing I might point out, they just did a study, I think it was, was it the, the FCC? Government agency did a study of, of carriers' coverage maps, you know, those beautiful pink and red glowing maps that you see on their websites, and said, yeah, not so much. That's, <laughs> I don't want to use the word lie, but you might. It's not exactly what you're going to get. So don't look at the coverage maps and go, honey, let's get a 5G phone. We're right smack dab in the middle. You might not be. In fact, this whole thing is a, it's a bit off, a bit of a ways off. So I'm just going to mention that. Let's see, what happened this week? What's been going on? I always have to, it's hard for me. You know, I do, um, I do podcasts all week about tech, and it's hard to, for me to remember what we've talked about and what we haven't. Remind me. Did we talk about the Hellabyte? Okay, now you got to understand, I'm in California, and uh, this is a very California crusade by a, um, a former physics student, Austin Sendek, uh, UC Davis, who started a campaign. Now, you may know, you probably do know, about the different designations for, for bytes. There's, you know, a byte is eight bits. That's one in a computer. A bit is an on or off, one or zero. So eight ones or zeros makes a byte that can represent 256 different states. And it's usually what's used to represent a letter in the alphabet uppercase lowercase numbers punctuation they all fit within a byte 
Uh, when you get a thousand of those bytes, we use, uh, I guess it's the Greek word for thousand, kilo, kilobyte. It's like kilometer, right? A kilobyte. Then a, a, a thousand kilobytes is a megabyte. You've heard these, right? Mega, thousand. Actually, mega is million, right? Mega millions. Isn't that a, that's a lottery thing in California? Mega million. So mega. Mega is a million of something, a million bytes. Then there's, after megabyte, there's a gigabyte, meg, gig. It actually, it, it actually goes on. You don't really often, you hear terabyte for a hard drive, right? So, uh, and then after that, you know, it kind of falls off the edge of the earth, except no, there are more of them. There are many more of them. After, a, after gigabyte, terabyte, then a thousand terabytes, which is, uh, let's see, a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes, which is a thousand megabytes. So megabytes, uh, a, a million, gigabytes, a billion, terabytes, a trillion, petabyte would be, what, a quadrillion. There's another word you don't hear a lot about. Then there's, after petabyte, there's some more. There's exabyte. It's a thousand petabytes. There's zettabyte. It's actually, you know, I'm probably confusing things. A thousand is a decimal. And really, we're, we should be talking in uh, a binary. So it's a thousand twenty-four. But anyway, you get the idea. Zettabyte. And then finally, yottabyte, which is 1,024 to the eighth bits. <laughs> a yada. These are all, they all come from uh, Greek. It's called the international system of quantities and it is there is there's the international electronic technical commission the iec which publishes these standards and so forth but we've stopped we stopped at yottabyte we don't have anything past a yottabyte and you, you know you don't want to talk about a million yottabytes or a billion yottabytes i guess you could it doesn't come up that much but this guy uh, austin sendak 10 years ago proposed that after Yottabyte, we'd have Hellabyte. <laughs> and we're, you know, we're eventually, we're going to get there. We're going to get there because, you know, there's more and more things in the world. In fact, Google, if you search for something like bytes to Hellabytes, actually has a calculator, a conversion widget that will convert. They, they, they kind of signed up. Sendak is now at Stanford. He's a software company CEO. Wolfram Alpha has Hella calculations. <laughs> now, maybe if you're not from California, you don't remember or don't know that Hella it was was commonly used. That's kind of Valley Girl speak. Oh, that's Hella, awesome. That kind of thing. Unfortunately, there are other proposals for what comes after a Yada bite. There's also a Bronto bite, like Brontosaurus. <laughs> this has not yet been resolved. I might add, it's still up in the air. Hella bite could still win. There's Rana bite. R O N N A. These actually, that's that's kind of the the leader at this point. I don't know why. Ten to the twenty seventh, and Keta or Queta, Q U E T T A byte. That's what's currently being considered. Queta byte is ten to the thirtieth. Rona byte or Rana byte is ten to the twenty seventh. I like Hella and Bronto myself. <laughs> don't you? Uh, anyway, I just wanted to mention this because it's not yet decided. Write a letter to your I don't know who. The IEC, I guess, your member of Congress and say, we want hell. Hellabyte's useful. The mass of the sun, for instance, you could say, you know, is 2,200 yada tons. But it's actually which 2.2 helitons, which is better, right? The sun is 2.2 helitons. Instead of 300 yada whites, it releases, yada watts, it releases 0.3 heliwatts. I like that. <laughs> Somebody is in the chat room saying, you know, lot of bytes is still available too. <laughs> I think at some point you just go one, two, three, many. Yeah. The number of atoms in 12 kilograms of carbon 12 is 0.6 hell atoms, hella atoms. I like it. I don't know. Just thought I'd bring that up. <laughs> just thought maybe you'd want to weigh in on that to write your member of the IEC. Say Bronto is good, Hella is good, Rana and Queta. I don't. That sounds like a girl's names. I don't know. I don't, I don't understand the value of that. I don't know where they're going with that. But that's currently the front runner. So let's get involved here. Let's stop this entirely. Speaking of science, I'm I'm 
We're really glad to see that uh, the incoming president, Joe Biden, is going to make the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy a cabinet level agency, which means science will have a seat at the cabinet table. I think that's fantastic. He selected uh, a geneticist or nominated a geneticist, Eric Lander. He's a mathematician and geneticist. He helped map the human genome and uh, he's the head of the Broad Institute of Boston based biomedical research center famous for its work on CRISPR the gene editing technology also a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Harvard Medical School don't you hate these overachievers we well, just pick one job just do one anyway a good person to head this up I'm so glad the office the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy this is something I and many of my geek friends have been lobbying for because right now neither Congress nor the White House really has the information I think they need to deal with the modern issues today we're facing in science and technology. It's not, you know, it's fine. I mean, I wouldn't expect uh, our, our leaders to be scientists necessarily, but I love it that science has a seat at the table. I was really happy to see that. That's good news. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. In our last installment, we saw how the FCC shifted from an initial VHF-UHF band plan that was radically different from today's allocations to a proposal which closely parallels the frequencies we have today. Amateurs were happier with the January 1945 plan over the November 1944 one as it restored our 10 meter band back where it belonged and gave us a full four megacycles at six meters. One person who was not happy with the January 1945 plan was Edwin Armstrong, inventor of the regenerative, super regenerative, and super heterodyne receivers, and the father of FM. He wanted the FM broadcast band to stay in the 42 to 50 megacycle area. Instead, he suddenly saw it transferred up to 84 to 102 megacycles, which would make every FM station and receiver obsolete. He knew that David Sarnoff of RCA was behind this as RCA wanted television in the frequencies now occupied by FM. Sarnoff and the RCA engineers had an interesting argument. FM, they said, should be moved higher in frequency to avoid the sporadic E skip. Armstrong fought back. He pointed out that FM, due to its capture effect, was less susceptible to skip interference than television, which used AM for the video carrier. He ran tests and submitted data showing that the skip interference to FM would be far less than imagined and certainly a fraction of what TV would endure. The ARRL, by the way, was in favor of moving FM up to the 84 to 102 megacycle area. To counteract the arguments that FM receivers would become obsolete by the move, QST in the May 1945 issue ran the schematic of a one-tube converter which Hallicrafters said they could build for $5.60. In late May 1945, the FCC announced the three alternatives that were being considered for the disputed 44 through 108 megacycle region. They were, in alternative number one, 44 to 48 megacycles. Amateur, we would have a 7 meter band under this proposal. 48 to 50 megacycles, facsimile broadcasting. 50 to 54 megacycles, educational FM broadcasting. 54 to 68 megacycles, commercial FM broadcasting. 68 to 74 megacycles, TV channel 1. 74 to 78 megacycles, aeronautical fixed and mobile. 
and 78 to 108 megacycles TV channels 2 through 6. Alternative number 2 was as follows. 44 to 56 megacycles TV channels 1 and 2. 56 to 60, the amateur 5 meter band. 60 to 66, TV channel 3. 66 to 68, facsimile broadcasting. 68 to 72, educational FM broadcasting. 72 to 86, commercial FM broadcasting. 86 to 104, TV channels 4 through 6. And 104 through 108 megacycles would be non-government, fixed and mobile. In alternative number three, the proposed allocations were as follows. 44 to 50 megacycles, TV channel 1. 50 to 54, amateur 6 meter band. 54 to 84, TV channels 2 through 6. 84 through 88, educational FM broadcasting. 88 through 102, commercial FM broadcasting. 102 through 104, facsimile broadcasting and 104 through 108 megacycles, non-government fixed and mobile. Except for the 44 through 108 megacycle region, which was still up in the air, the 25 through 44 megacycles and frequencies above 108 megacycles were fairly well established at today's allocations. The only major exception was the 470 through 480 megacycle band, which was still allocated to facsimile broadcasting. The FCC indicated that tests would be run throughout the summer months to determine which alternative was the best. Reaction was quick to the proposals. Except for the ARRL, almost none of the major players liked alternative number two, so the choice lay between one and three. The ARRL found number two acceptable because it preserved our five meter band. Of the other two alternatives, the ARRL was strongly opposed to number one. A 44 through 48 megacycle 7 meter band would have too much skip, was too close to our 10 meter band, and too far from 2 meters. In the end, the ARRL came out in favor of alternative number 3 because it was believed that the FM band should be as far as possible from our ham bands in order to avoid IF interference to FM receivers. Naturally, Major Armstrong was in favor of alternative number 1. He continued to make extensive tests and bombarded the FCC with the results. However, Armstrong never realized that the political clout of General Sarnoff and RCA could overcome any test results. The Major thought he had the summer to complete his tests. Instead, on June 27, 1945, the FCC decided on alternative number three with a few minor changes to bring the allocations in line with what we have today. FM was definitely at 88 through 108 megacycles, and amateurs had a new 6 meter band at 50 to 54 megacycles, nestled snug between TV channels 1 and 2. Armstrong was stunned, but he didn't give up. As late as 1947, he was still submitting data to the FCC in regards to the effect of skip on FM broadcasts, but it was too late. For a period of time, there were two FM broadcast bands as stations in the new 88 through 108 megacycle allocation coexisted with the older ones between 42 to 50 megacycles. But by 1947, the old FM band was a memory and sat waiting for Channel 1 to take over. However, a new controversy was brewing. With thousands of amateurs on our new 6 meter band and thousands of TVs pouring out of mostly RCA factories, a new concept was entering the amateur language. TVI. In our next installment, we will look at the TV wars of the 1940s and why ARRL wanted Channel 2 instead of Channel 1 eliminated. So, until then, I hope your 6 meter QSOs aren't causing interference to the Texaco Star Theater. Originating from Albany, New York and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Here's the weekly AMSAT report. 
After the launch and deployment of RAD FXSAT-02, or FOX-1E, on January 17th, the AMSAT engineering team is going through its orbit checklist. Coordinating with the operations team, the engineering team has been working to determine the problem with extremely low signals from the telemetry beacon updates as they become available. The November-December issue of the AMSAT Journal now is available at launch.amsat.org. AMSAT members can view it by clicking on the Journal tab and then on the issue they want to read. Following login, you can view the full journal in color. The AMSAT News Report comes courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Thanks, Bruce. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Friday, January 22, 2021. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington, reports that we just witnessed 12 consecutive days with no sunspots, which many of us found a bit unsettling. But fortunately, Solar Cycle 25 actively returned with new sunspot number 2796 on January 15th. Instead of moving from the east across the solar horizon, it emerged in the southern hemisphere just west of center. Currently, we are seeing sunspot regions 2797 and 2798, which emerged in the southeast, and looking at images from the stereo spacecraft, we see another bright sunspot on the horizon. Average daily sunspot numbers increased from zero last week to 14.7 in this reporting period, which was January 14th through the 20th. Average daily solar flux rose from 73.8 to 76.1, and geomagnetic indicators sank to very quiet levels. Average daily planetary A indices dropped from 5.9 to 4, and the average daily middle latitude A index from 4.4 to 3. The outlook for the next month looks pretty good. The predicted daily solar flux for the next 30 days is 80 on January 22nd through the 28th, 75 on January 29th all the way to February 3rd, 76 from February 4th through the 10th, 77 from February 11th through the 17th, and 76 on February 18th through the 20th. The predicted planetary A indice is 5 on January 22nd through the 26th, 8 on January 27th and 28th, 5 on January 29th and 31st, and 10 on February 1st through the 2nd. The geomagnetic field will be quiet on January 22nd and the 28th through the 30th, and also on February 4th, 10th, and quiet to unsettled on January 23rd and 27th. It will also be quiet on February 5th and 6th, 9th through the 13th, and 17th, quiet to active on January 24th through the 26th, on January 31st, and again on February 1st, 3rd, 7th, and 14th through the 16th. Go get that DX. In Germany, the regulator has looked kindly on radio links between automated stations. The German National Radio Society, the DARC, reports that the permitted radiated power limit for amateur radio links between automatically operating stations has increased to 1 kilowatt ERP. For these operations, the DARC's VHF, UHF and SHF department and their Department of Frequency Management have agreed with the German regulator, BNETSA, and the primary user of the gigahertz bands that the maximum permissible radiated power will now be 30 dBW ERP. You can find out more on the DARC website at darc.de. It's worth noting that while the main website is, of course, in German, you will see a Union flag image at the top of the page. If you click on that, the site reverts to the English language version. Grab yourself a piece of paper and a pencil. You're going to want to write some notes down on this one. The popular American TV show Last Man Standing is preparing to go QRT. When the show wraps up its final day of shooting this spring, it's going to be saying farewell, ham radio style. The primetime show, which became a showcase for amateur radio through its main character, Mike Baxter, KA0XTT, is leaving the air after nine years, but not before it gets on the air on the amateur bands. Executive producer John Omodeo, AA6JA, said that a big farewell special event station is planned for KA6 LMS between March 14th and March 30th, the last day of the show's production. At that point, the mailing address of the Last Man Standing Amateur Radio Club will also change to 11684 Ventura Boulevard, Suite 810, Studio City, California, 
91604. The show grew even more popular after star Tim Allen made things real by getting the call sign KK6OTD. It also featured guest radio operators on the set during meal breaks. John went on to say that rather than have it slip away silently, we should have one more activation of KA6LMS right now. With operators from the Great South Bay Amateur Radio Club, the K2H Special Event Station, and the 12 Days of Christmas, the activation will give everyone a last chance to work KA6 LMS in an ambitious special event. Be sure and be listening on CW, Single Sideband, D-Star, DMR, Ridi, PSK, and FT8. Consider it one last hurrah for last man standing. Once again, that special event of KA6 LMS is going to be on the air between March 14th and March 30th, which is the last day of the show's production. ICOM will be releasing new firmware for its IC705, the IC7300, and IC9700 transceivers. The updates are planned to improve the user experience and incorporate communications modes such as FT8. The firmware is due to be released around the end of January 2021, starting with the IC705 and followed shortly by version 7300 and the IC9700. The updates will be available as free downloads from the following web address, www.icomjapan.com slash support slash firmware underscore driver. The planned updates include a one-touch FT8 mode preset, Scroll mode automatically keeping the operating signal within the scope range. Multiple function dial items have been improved, which is new for the 73 and 9700. Compatible with the AH705 antenna tuner for IC705. WLAN access point function is added for the IC705, and other updates are planned for each model. ICOM also plans to update the RSBA1 version 2, CS705, and the CS9700 programming software. To keep up to date on all the ICOM news, follow the ICOM social media channels or sign up with their newsletter. New firmware ICOM updates for the IC705, the IC7300, and the IC9700 will also include smoother FT8 operations. The Federal Communications Commission has declared that federal law protects the right of property owners and tenants to install and use satellite dish antennas, even if the antennas are visible from the street. The panel's ruling on January 11th invalidates an ordinance in the city of Chicago, Illinois, that restricts such installations. The FCC says that its rule, known as the Over-the-Air Reception Devices Rule, protects the antenna's use and allows video consumers greater choice of content. Chicago had argued that its law, enacted in 2012, was put in place to enforce what it called aesthetic standards, and that the measure does not violate the federal ruling. The petition had been sought by the Satellite Broadcasting and Communications Association, DirecTV, and the DISH Network. The over-the-air reception devices rule does not apply, however, to AM or FM radio, CB radio, or amateur radio antennas. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. Foundations of Amateur Radio Amateur Radio is a living anachronism. We have this heady mix of ancient and bleeding edge, never more evident than in a digital mode called Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APRS. It's an amateur mode that's used all over the place to exchange messages like GPS coordinates, radio balloon and vehicle tracking data, battery voltages, weather station telemetry, text, bulletins, and increasingly other information as part of the expanding universe of the Internet of Things. There are mechanisms for message priority, point-to-point -point messages, announcements, and when Internet-connected computers are involved, solutions for mapping, email, and other integrations. The International Space Station has an APRS repeater on board. 
You'll also find disaster management like firefighting, earthquake and propagation reporting uses for APRS. There's tools like an SMS gateway that allows you to send an SMS via APRS if you're out of mobile range. There's software around that allows you to post to Twitter from APRS. You can even generate APRS packets using your mobile phone. In my radio travels, I'd come across the APRS.fi website many times. It's a place that shows you various devices on the APRS network. You can see vehicles as they move around, radio repeater information, weather, even historic charts of messages, so you can see temperatures over time, or battery voltage, or solar power generation, or whatever the specific APRS device is sending. As part of my exploration into all things new and exciting, I thought I'd start a new adventure with attempting to listen to the APRS repeater on the International Space Station. I'm interested in decoding APRS packets, seeing what's inside them, and what kinds of messages I can hear in my shack. Specifically for the experiment at hand, I wanted to hear what the ISS had to say. After testing some recommended tools and after considerable time hunting, I stumbled on Multimon NG. I should mention that it started life as Multimon by Tom, Hotel Bravo 9, Juliet November X-Ray, which he wrote in 1996. In 2012, Elias Onal wanted to use Multimon to decode from his new RTL-SDR dongle, and in the end he patched and brought the code into this century, and Multimon NG was born. It's available on Linux, macOS, and Windows, and it's under active development. It's a single command line tool that takes an audio input and produces a text output, and it's a great way to see what's happening under the hood, which is precisely what I want when I'm attempting to learn something new. In this case, my computer was already configured with a radio. I can record what the radio receives from the computer microphone, and I can play audio to the radio via the computer speaker. My magical tool, Multimon NG, has the ability to record audio and decode it using a whole raft of inbuilt decoders. For my test, I wanted to use the APRS decoder, cunningly disguised as an AFSK 1200 demodulator. I'll get to that in a moment. The actual process is as simple as tuning your radio in FM mode to the local APRS frequency and telling Multimon NG to listen. Every minute or so you'll see an APRS packet, or six, turn up on your screen. The process for the ISS is only slightly different, in that the APRS frequency is affected by Doppler shift, so I use gpredict to change the frequency as required. Multimon NG continued to happily decode the audio signal. I said that I'd get back to AFSK 1200. The 1200 represents the speed, 1200 board. The AFSK represents audio frequency shift keying, and it's a way to encode digital information by changing the frequency of an audio signal. One way to think of that is having two different tones, one representing a binary zero, the other representing a binary one. Play them over a loudspeaker and you have AFSK. Do that at 1200 board and you have AFSK 1200. When you do listen to AFSK and you know what a dial-up modem sounds like, it will come as no surprise that they use the same technique to encode digital information. Might have to dig up an old dial-up modem and hook it up to my radio one of these days. Speaking of ancient, the hero of our story, APRS, dates back to the early days of microcomputers, the era of the first two computers in my life, the Apple II and the Commodore VIC-20. Bob, Whiskey Bravo 4 Alpha Papa Romeo, implemented the first ancestor of APRS on an Apple II in 1982. Then in 1984, he used a VIC-20 to report the position and status of horses in a 160 km radius using APRS. As for the International Space Station, the APRS repeater is currently switched off in favour of the crossband voice repeater, so I'll have to wait a little longer to decode something from space. I'm on it. Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Divers are searching for black boxes off Indonesia after air crash last Saturday, January 9th, of a Boeing 737 jet on a domestic flight to Pontianak on Borneo Island, a trip distance of about 740 kilometers. The plane disappeared from radar screens four minutes after takeoff and crashed into the Java Sea. Authorities pinpointed the area where the black boxes may be located if they lifted chunks of the plane's fuselage off the seabed. 
Every commercial black box is fitted with a low-frequency underwater locator beacon. When it's immersed in water, it will begin to radiate an acoustic signal with a nominal operating frequency of 37.5 kilohertz, which can be received and transformed into an audible signal by a receiver. The beacon is sometimes called a pinger due to the audible signal created by the receiver. The devices send out a signal on contact with salt water that can be picked up within a radius of about two kilometers. At such a short range, the location of the wreck should already be more or less pinpointed in order to find the device within its 30-day battery life. Here are a few news briefs coming up this week. Winter Field Day is January 30th and 31st, sponsored by the Winter Field Day Association, a dedicated group of amateur radio operators who believe that emergency communications in a winter environment is just as important as the preparations and practice that is done each summer but with some additional unique operational concerns. The event will take place on both CW and SSB only. Bob Witt, K0NR, has proposed that summits on the air and similar programs designate 146.48 MHz as the North America Adventure Frequency FM Simplex Channel on 2 meters. This is to avoid the national calling frequency of 146.52, which can be busy. Those using 146.52 MHz are expected to move to another frequency after making contact. Radio amateurs in Australia may use the prefix AX, that's Alpha X-ray, on Australia Day, January 26th. The day commemorates the arrival of the First Fleet in 1788, the raising of the British flag, and the establishment of European settlements. The annual day celebrates Australian history and culture. To celebrate Peru's 200 years as a republic, the Peruvian Radio Club will field some special call signs throughout 2021. Listen for OC200P, OC200E, OC200R, and OC200U. The single letter suffixes spell Peru. Only one of the commemorative call signs will be on the air at a time. OC200P in January, May, and September. OC200E in February, June, and October. OC200R in March, July, and November, and OC200U in April, August, and December. QSL to OA40. And finally, the free English language AMSAT EA January newsletter features an article by Carlos Flores, EA3HAH about his experiences using FT4 on the linear SSB amateur satellites. He reports good results with 1 or 2 watts and was able to decode without problems on almost all calls. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. And now, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In the first two segments of this series on promoting your ham radio club's event, we covered the basic outline for a two-paragraph public service announcement. If you missed that show, check out our archived shows on the internet. Stay tuned to This Week in Amateur Radio when we'll repeat our webpage address. So this time, we'll put all the information about our public service announcement onto paper and get it ready to mail to radio and TV stations in the area. We covered a sample PSA last time. Let's get out our notes and get the word processor running and get ready to enter the final draft. I would suggest a bold, large type heading which reads, Public Service Announcement. This will go all the way across the top of the paper. 
Remember, the final product must fit onto a single side of a single sheet of paper. This is very important, as I'll explain later. Next line, left justified, type in kill date. This is the date that you want your PSA to stop running, which would usually be the day after the event. Next, paste in the text of your two paragraph PSA. Make sure it's spell checked and double spaced. Your PSA text should be a large, bold, simple text font. Now hit the enter key a few times and enter contact person. This should be the name, address, email, fax, phone number of a person to contact for information about the event described in the PSA. This person should be able to answer phoned questions about the event. Be careful whom you choose for this position. Be sure to include any relevant titles like club president for this person. Also include a formal address and contact information about the club submitting the event. I always like to add a five word phrase in parenthesis after the name of the club, like the Bowen County Amateur Radio Club, a not-for-profit organization. Take a look at your PSA sheet. It should be visibly obvious with a very quick glance what part is to be read on the air. The starting and ending points should be very obvious. The script must be grammatically correct and spelling perfect. You may punctuate for breathing marks if you know how to do that. It should also be readable in 30 seconds or less. Have more than one person read it timed to be sure it's the proper length. Remember, the burden is on you, so don't give the PSA manager or disc jockey a reason not to read your PSA on the air. Make it ready to use right out of the envelope. Any PSA with bad grammar, single line spacing, misspellings, or just a lousy read are easily passed over for others that are easier to read on the air as is. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Radio amateurs in Israel have lost much of their spectrum between 1 and 6 gigahertz and suffered a draconian power reduction on 10 gigahertz. Israel has three classes of amateur license. Class A, the advanced, up to 1.5 kilowatts. Class B, the general license, up to 250 watts. And Class C, the novice license, that's 100 watts on four of the HF bands with lower power access to some of the higher bands. Israel's Ministry of Communication Amateur Allocations document, produced in November 2020, shows these changes to be between 1 and 10.5 gigahertz. The 23 centimeter band, formerly 1240 to 1300 megahertz, has been reduced to just 1260 to 1270 megahertz and can only be used by Class A license holders for satellite uplinks with a maximum power of 25 watts. The 13 centimeter band appears to have remained the same, although the transmission power allowed has been reduced. Class A and Class B licensees now have 2320 to 2340 megahertz using 15 watts, 2400 to 2402 megahertz at 100 watts, and 2402 to 2450 megahertz at 100 milliwatts. The 9 centimeter band, which used to be 3400 to 3475 megahertz, has been entirely lost. The 6 cm band now only has two segments remaining, 5650 to 5670 MHz using 50 watts and 5830 to 5850 MHz at 200 milliwatts. Only Class A licensees can use these allocations and it appears that only satellite operation is now allowed. The 3 cm band has suffered a dramatic power reduction. 10 to 10.45 gigahertz maximum power is now just 100 milliwatts and is available for Class A licensees only. It was 100 watts for Class A and 25 watts for Class B licensees. 10.45 to 10.50 gigahertz is now satellite operations only with power limits of Class A 100 watts and Class B 25 watts. The AGM of the Israel Amateur Radio Club was held on December the 30th, 2020. A video of the Zoom event is on their YouTube channel, with the segment relating to these changes labelled Danger Amateur Radio at 2 hours, 53 minutes and 25 seconds. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will return March 13th and 14th for a full 48 hours 
QSO Today host Eric Guth, WGA6 IGR announced this week. ARRL is a QSO Today Expo partner. Guth said the inaugural QSO Today Expo last August attracted more than 16,000 attendees, and he anticipates that the March 21 event will be even more successful. The upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will feature new speakers and presenters, panel discussions, and kit building workshops, among other activities. Guth pointed out that attendees can log in from anywhere. While he anticipates a good turnout by those who typically attend such ham radio events, the Virtual Expo also offers an opportunity for those concerned about pandemic travel restrictions, as well as for those who don't typically attend. At our last expo, we found that 60% of attendees don't go to in-person national conferences, and 40% don't attend state or local events, Guth said, noting that distance and the high cost of travel and lodging were the most off-sited reasons. Registration is required, and to help cover the costs of staging the event, there will be a charge. Advanced tickets are $10 or $12.50 at the door, and include entry for the live two-day show, as well as a 30-day on-demand period. At the expo, visitors can learn from a lineup of such well-known ham radio personalities as Bob Alfin, K4UEE, on My Favorite the Expeditions, to DXCC, the Top 10 Most Wanted, Michael Forster, W0IH, on using the Arduino in your shack, and Ron Jones, K7RJ, on 3D printer basics. Take part in live virtual kit building workshops. The kits will be available for purchase and delivered to attendees in time for the expo. Walk through the virtual exhibit hall and visit a, an array of amateur radio vendors. See live demonstrations of the latest equipment. The show will leverage the newer video technology to provide a better experience for attendees. Those planning to attend the expo may take advantage of new speaker calendar technology to create their own calendar of presentations in their time zones, which can be saved to a Google or Outlook calendar. Registrants may return over 30 days following the live event to catch speakers and presentations missed during the period, as well as explore and re-engage exhibitor offerings. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo has all the familiar hallmarks of an in-person ham fest, including opportunities to connect and learn. ARRL Product Development Manager Bob Inderblitzen, NQ1R, said. Expect to bump into friends and well-known experts and personalities from throughout our worldwide ham radio community. He explained that attendees visiting an exhibit or virtual lounge will be able to interact with other attendees in those settings. Flex Radio is the Expo's platinum sponsor. Gold sponsors as of this time include Elecraft, RF Finder, and CSI. An unlikely launch system, one using a 70-foot rocket fired from a converted jumbo jet, sent 10 small satellites into low Earth orbit on Sunday, January 17th. One of those CubeSats was AMSAT's Rad FX Sat 2 or FOX 1E, the fifth and final FOX 1 satellite built by AMSAT. It was constructed under a partnership between AMSAT and Vanderbilt University and carries a radiation effects experiment. HAMS will be able to decode data from the telemetry and experiments using Fox Telem version 1.09 or later. The CubeSat was a demonstration flight staged by billionaire Richard Branson's California-based company Virgin Orbit. The successful launches from the Boeing 747 took place almost eight months after the failed try last May. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. Ham SCI has issued a call for abstracts for its virtual workshop, March 19th and 20th, hosted by the University of Scranton and sponsored by the National Science Foundation. The primary objective of Ham SCI workshop is to bring together the amateur radio community and professional scientists, said Ham SCI founder Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF. The theme is mid-latitude ionospheric physics, which is especially important to us because of the vast majority of hams living in the mid-latitude regions. 
Invited tutorial speakers will be Mike Ruhamani of Virginia Tech's Super Darn Initiative and Joe Dzekovic, K1YOW. Elizabeth Bruton of the Science Museum of London will be the keynote speaker. Submit abstracts by February 15th. The March conference will also serve as a team meeting for the Personal Space Weather Station project. Frizzell said he'll coordinate it with the respective teams for their abstracts. The MSCI workshop welcomes abstracts related to the development of personal weather stations, ionospheric science, atmospheric science, radio science, space weather, radio astronomy, and any science topic that can appropriately be related to the amateur radio hobby. Submissions related to the workshop theme of the mid-latitude ionospheric physics are encouraged. Abstracts will be reviewed by the Science and Program Committee, and authors will be notified no later than March 1st. Virtual poster presentations are welcome, but due to time constraints, requests for oral presentation slots may not be guaranteed. The following is a listing of the upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. You can visit the ARRL Learning Network to register, check on upcoming webinars, and view previously recorded sessions. The following schedule is subject to change. Easy Helical Copper Tape and PVC 2 Meter Vertical Antenna, hosted by John Portoon, W6NBC. Learn how to quickly build a tiny 18 inch continuously loaded lightweight portable or base station 2 meter omnidirectional vertical with performance and efficiency comparable to a 5 foot J pole. All you need is copper tape and PVC pipe from the hardware store, and the cost is roughly $10. It's an easy afternoon's homebrew project, ideal for the new ham, but equal to the experienced ham's needs. It's great for events like bikeathons. It also makes an excellent ham radio club hands-on building project, and the design is adaptable to other bands. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021, at 10 a.m. Pacific, that's 1 p.m. Eastern, or 1800 UTC. Interesting stories about ham radio and weather spotting with host Rob Macedo, KD1CY. One of the most critical ways amateur radio supports agencies such as the National Weather Service, NWS, National Hurricane Center, and Emergency Management is through weather spotting via the NWS Skywarn program. This presentation reviews some interesting stories about how amateurs involved in Skywarn have saved lives and property and why this is an important amateur radio activity. This informative webinar is scheduled for Thursday, February 11th, 2021 at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, or 0100 UTC on Friday, February 12th. Scott Wright, K0MD, a well-known amateur radio contester and past editor of the National Contest Journal, NCJ, was a co-principal investigator of a research project into the use of convalescent plasma to treat COVID-19 patients. The study, Convalescent Plasma Antibody Levels and the Risk of Death from COVID-19, appeared in the January 13th edition of the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. The study began early last April under the co-leadership of Wright and Dr. Michael Joyner, both of the Mayo Clinic and a cast of investigators that included Dr. Peter Marks, AB3XC. The Mayo Clinic was the lead institution for the program. Wright said the paper reported a 6.3% absolute reduction in mortality for those who received high titer convalescent plasma and a 36% relative risk reduction in mortality for those who received it while not on a ventilator. Wright said he hopes the study will have an impact globally where more advanced and expensive therapies may not be available. The U.S. Convalescent Plasma Expanded Access Program was a collaborative project between the U.S. government and the Mayo Clinic to provide access to convalescent plasma for patients in the U.S. who are hospitalized with COVID-19. The Australian Communications and Media Authority, or the ACMA, has announced that processing backlogs affecting amateur radio call signs is close to being resolved. The Australian Maritime College, which handles these changes for the ACMA, was challenged by disruptions caused by the pandemic, as well as a large influx of requests for call sign changes. The wave of requests followed an announcement by the ACMA that hams will be permitted greater flexibility in call sign choice. 
The changes included permitting foundation licensees the option of a three-letter call sign instead of one with four letters, making the call signs more compatible with the protocols of digital communication. The ACMA writes in a recent bulletin that we understand that the Australian Maritime College has almost cleared the backlog and will revert to normal processing time shortly. We'll continue to monitor processing times and work with the college to ensure qualifications and call sign services that are provided for the benefit of the amateur radio community. The brutal murder story broadcast over a three-day period on the United Kingdom's ITV channel was no fictional drama. The episodes, which were transmitted between Monday 11th and Wednesday 13th January, recount the killing in June of 1989 of Oxfordshire radio amateur Peter Dixon, G0HFQ, and his wife Gwenda. The couple were on holiday in Pembrokeshire, southwest Wales, where Peter had been operating as GW0HFO slash M. The two were found dead shot at point blank range within a half a mile of their campsite on July 5th. The Radio Society of Great Britain was asked by police to put out a QST asking amateurs to check their logbooks between 29th of June and the 5th of July, police believing that Peter had made a contact with another mobile station on 28 megahertz on the morning of Wednesday, June 28th. They were looking for clues, any clues at all. Still, it took years of detective work before the case ended with an arrest and conviction. John Cooper, a former farm laborer, was found guilty of the killings in 2001. In an odd twist to the story, Cooper himself had appeared on ITV on a popular game show just days before robbing and shooting the ham radio operator and his wife. The AWRL invites nominations for awards that recognize excellence in amateur radio educational, technological, and public relations pursuits. Nominations are also open for the Hiram Percy Maxim Award, the AWRL's premier award to honor a young licensee. The Hiram Percy Maxim Award is the premier honor for a radio amateur and AWRL member younger than 21 whose accomplishments and contributions are of the most exemplary nature within the framework of amateur radio activities. Nominations must be made through your AWRL section manager who will forward nominations to ARRL headquarters by March 31st, 2021. Nomination forms and supporting information should document as thoroughly as possible the nominee's amateur radio achievements and contributions during the previous calendar year. The AWRL Herb S. Breyer Instructor of the Year Award. This award honors an ARRL volunteer amateur radio instructor or professional classroom teacher who uses creative instructional approaches and reflects the highest values of the amateur radio community. The award highlights quality of and commitment to licensing instruction. Nominations are due March 15th, 2021. Technical awards are as follows. The ARRL Microwave Development Award pays tribute to a radio amateur or a group of radio amateurs who contribute to the development of the amateur radio microwave bands. The nomination deadline is March 31st, 2021. The AWRL Technical Service Award recognizes a radio amateur or group who provide amateur radio technical assistance or training to others. The nomination deadline is March 31st, 2021. The AWRL Technical Innovation Award commends a radio amateur or group of radio amateurs who develop and apply new technical ideas or techniques in amateur radio. The nomination deadline is March 31, 2021. The Knight Distinguished Service Award. The Knight Distinguished Service Award honors exceptional contributions by an AWRL section manager to the health and vitality of the AWRL. The nomination deadline is April 30th, 2021. It was named for Joe T. Knight, W5PDY, who was commended for his exemplary service not only as AWRL New Mexico section manager for more than a quarter century, but also for his willingness to share his knowledge and leadership skills. The Philip J. McGann Memorial Silver Antenna Award. The AWRL Public Relations Committee invites nominations for this award. This award recognizes and honors the efforts of an AWRL member volunteer who demonstrates success in amateur radio public relations and creates greater awareness and understanding for amateur radio through efforts focused on the media and general public. 
The nomination deadline is May 14, 2021. The AWRL Board of Directors makes the final determination of award recipients. Winners typically are announced following the board's July meeting. More information about these awards is on the ARRL website or contact Steve Ewald, WV1X, at AWRL headquarters. Originating from Albany, New York and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, an FCC action against a deer decoy marketer charged with radio interference. The U.S. government agency, it seems, is making some noises involving, of all things, animal noises. Can the grunt or snort or bleat of a deer be considered QRM? Probably not, but instructions being transmitted wirelessly directing a hunting decoy to utter those noises is quite another matter. The FCC and a U.S. company called Primos have entered into a consent decree over its product, the Wagon Whitetail Electronic Deer Tail Decoy, for what the FCC is called non-compliance with Part 15 of its rules. The FCC believes the decoy's remote, which users report has a transmission range of between 40 and 60 yards, exceeds authorized field strength emission limits and could interfere with nearby electronics. According to the FCC, the company acknowledged that it had marketed six such models that exceed those limits. Primos has agreed to embark on a plan for compliance and has begun a voluntary recall. The company will also pay a civil penalty that could be considered somewhat dear, $55,000. Primos noted that it had received no complaints of interference occurring with any other devices. As for interference complaints from any of the local wildlife, no bucks or does were available to grunt, snort, bleat, or otherwise comment for this report. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Letter, the AWRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This week.